Too many times, Catholics leave Mass feeling as disconnected from God as they felt when they walked into Mass. That's because they never welcomed the personal conversation God wants to have with them there. If that's you sometimes, join us now for Afterword, as we seek to live in a relationship with God's Word after having heard it on Sunday, and discover for yourself the personal conversation God wants to have with you. <laughs> thanks for being here, Father. Of course. Thanks for having me, Dan. This is great always to do this with you. So, It's a great joy to be with here, you here in this very special place at our church. Uh, right now, it's 40 hours devotion at our church, and, and I just love that because th this Sunday's readings, um, what really stuck out to me was the first reading where it said that God will be an instructor to the nations. And, and I circled that and highlighted that, and I said to myself, am I allowing God to be an instructor to me? <laughs> you know, I can't control presidents and, you know, governments and militaries, but I can control me. And am I inviting God to be my instructor? And, and there's no better place for Jesus to be an instructor in your life uh, than, than in the Eucharist. Um, so I'm excited to do this podcast here from, uh, from the cry room at our church with the Eucharist behind us. Uh, and recognize that this is a tremendous place to allow God to begin to instruct us. Amen. Yeah, and this is a great time, and I think is a great season because I don't know how much you know about forty hours and all that, but you know, forty hours comes actually all the way back. Uh, it's a tradition that started in Europe and was brought over here, at least to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, by Saint John Neumann. Um, but the whole point was that the forty hours represents uh, the forty hours that Christ was in the tomb. And so keeping watch, keeping vigil with him, that's kind of the tradition of it. But, you know, that number 40 has a lot of um, connotation and meaning for us in the Catholic faith. Forty years that the, you know, Israelites wandered in the desert. Uh, Moses was up the mountain for, uh, for 40 days. Uh, Jesus wandered in the desert for 40 days. You know, that 40 is, is a lot. It's, and the reason we use that number 40, you know, Noah, 40, you know, 40 days of flood, um, you know, all of that is because it's a time of transition. Like that number was used uh, to show that, you know, the way we would say like a few years or a few decades, we're saying that this is a time of transition, something that is going from one place to another, that something is changing. And that's the whole point of 40 hours. And especially we're doing 40 hours at the beginning of Advent, which is, you know, truly a blessing um, because this is a time of transition and a time of changing for us. Like, Advent is a time of preparation for our Lord's coming. Specifically, you know, of course, at Christmas, uh, you know, his first coming, but also these first two weeks we talk about his coming at the end of time, his second coming into our life. And you know, it's funny, uh, and maybe it's just an American thing or just it's a me thing, I don't know. Uh, we tend to want to rush transitions. We want to get right to the result. And yet 40 days, 40 years, 40 hours, for us as humans, that seems like an immense amount of time, and we just want to rush to the end. Amen. And God does so much good instruction in those transition periods. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, I look back at my marriage, I've been married since 2005, and I'm so blessed to have the wife that I have, to have a, a praying and godly wife, and to have kids who are coming to know the Lord. I mean, oh, it's just awesome. In fact, two of them were here at Adoration with our youth ministry uh, last night. Um, but one of the things I, I really felt was important um, was to have a long enough engagement. You know, um, I, I think that God, during our engagement, helped prepare ourselves. And now our engagement was nine months. I know some people have had longer engagements and shorter engagements. But it seemed like just the right amount of time, that, that it wasn't just asking my wife to marry me and then getting married, that there was a point to that transition time. Um, you know, and, and I imagine the same thing's true for the priesthood, that, that there's a long transition time. Yeah, yeah no, so we study uh, at the seminary anywhere from here in Philadelphia uh, seven to nine years. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so, yeah, it's a long transition, you know. Uh, we, we do the long dating game. We're, we're, we're like, <laughs> so anyone who's been waiting for a while before you got engaged, I, I get it, trust me. So, um, but, you know, the whole point, again, is the whole point of this transition, your engagement period, your, even your dating period, the point is we're discerning and we're preparing ourselves to follow whatever God's asking us to do. And at some point at that engagement, you realize 
that this is what God is calling you to do, how to grow closer to him. And so he's doing that through instructing you. He, he's instructing you know, through the priest, through pre-Cana, but also just through uh, growing closer to each other, you know. Yeah, and we so often want to rush that. And, uh, and we want to rush it, the transition periods for the people that we love too. Oh, I just want this family member to convert right away. Or I just want me to be past this sin right now. Amen. And, and that, those are godly desires to have that sense of urgency. But our Father is so patient with us. And I think He enjoys the process um, as much as He enjoys the outcome. And I, I think of my relationship with my kids. Like, I enjoy the process of them figuring out how to cook or figuring it out. Like, Naya was talking about shopping the other day, and she realized that she should learn how to save money. And it's just cool watching her learn how to save and learn how to shop. Um, and I'm just an earthly dad. So how much more patient is our Heavenly Father while we transition? Yeah, and, and the joy of those things, when you realize it, is so, is so great. You know, um, you know I, have two, I have two younger nieces, and... Uh, not to divulge too much about them, but they're, they're two and three. And so, you know, I remember, you know, when one day they, they couldn't walk. A week later I come home and they're, they're running around the house. And I'm like, what the heck just happened in this one week, you know? But if it happened like right as they like, were born, it's like, well, where's the joy of seeing them learn everything and grow and, you know, draw on that relationship? Because, you know, my sister, their mother, had to help teach them that. They had to help work with them on that. Uh, and the same thing with us. You know, we have to, you know, learn from God, you know, all that. You know, I, I said this to you the other day, uh, but a secret is when I know a homily is from me versus when a homily is from God. Uh, and the reason is, is that when the homily is from me, I start getting dry mouth. Like, I, I just, I'm like, literally, God's like, I love you but you need to stop talking right now because this isn't me, right? And I could feel it and I'm like, okay. And, but it's just learning that transition. It's, it's like, okay, am I allowing God to instruct me on what he wants me to say? Right. So, Yeah, and I think that's such an important message, not just for priests giving homilies, but for all Christians, uh, because all of us are called to be evangelists in various ways. It might just be in our house, or it might just, it might be, maybe you're invited to give a talk or a witness talk on a retreat. And I think to learn to allow God to instruct you as you prepare what you present and as you're presenting. Um, and sometimes I feel like in my house, God instructs me to just be quiet, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that that's, that that's okay because my kids just aren't, they don't have ears to hear it yet. Yeah. And, and to be at peace with that time of transition. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there's that 40, 40 days, 40 hours or whatever it is, yeah. it takes them, them to transition. You know, one thing we spoke about last week, and we uh, a little bit, and we never really uh, fleshed it out and talked about it. Uh, in the first reading a couple weeks, the other week, David hears a call from God, and, uh, and it's to be king, to be, uh, which, is a, which prefigures Christ, because Christ means king, uh, an anointed one, a king. But he hears this call, and he be, he's on, in the process of becoming king, but before he's made king, uh, he makes an agreement with the people, with the various leaders in the community, and he, they kind of set up guardrails. You know, so there's this call, but then it's like, okay, God, if you have this call, how are we going to implement that? And, and I think that that happened in a transition period, you know, that, that those guardrails get set up. And I've seen that in my life, where I was like, okay, God, uh, you're calling me to this, like, called me to Africa, called me to adopt my kids, called me to marriage, uh, called me to serve in this church, called me to do this ministry. And, and, okay, God, I can see that you've called me, but now help me discern the guardrails. And help me to make a schedule, like our podcast. We're called to do this podcast, but well, it helps us to do it at the same time every day, at the same time every week on the same day, so we could have a healthy relationship with it. Um, also, I feel like God's called me to pray for my family. So I wake up five to ten minutes early, and I feel like my prayer is now stretching to 20 minutes, so i got to get up earlier. Um, I don't know if that's because they need holiness or I need holiness, <laughs> but I set up those guardrails. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, so you take this calling that's very personal, but then you make these very objective guardrails so you can carry it out. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so, and I, I wanted to make this very clear for people who are watching or listening, that we're not saying that like, okay, this is the structured time and God, you can only talk to me in that moment. That's not what we're saying, but you know, we have to have boundaries because otherwise 
we find we can find ourselves going, well, okay, is this what I'm supposed to do right now? Is this not, you know, and we can, and we become manic, and then we're not listening to, to God because we're so busy worrying that if it's God's voice. Whereas, you know, uh, Robert Frost had a, a, a poem, uh, and in it, it just goes, it just goes, uh, good walls make good neighbors, uh, or good fences make good neighbors. And I think that's so important, again, because we just have guardrails. They're just things of, hey, this is kind of the structure. This is what I set up in my life. I just had this routine because it will help focus us towards what God is calling. Because God, again, might call us to do something crazy, like go to Africa. Yeah. Uh, I still can't believe that, by the way. But, um, you know, he, he might do that. But he did that in your guardrails. Like when during your, your prayer time, he's like, okay, you know, you weren't just driving down 95 or whatever. And he just said, you know, I want you to go to Africa. And then like, I just got on, to, exactly, <laughs> got got on, on a plane and <laughs> exactly. to go down to the airport and just right. drive away. He, he does, he works in, in parameters so that we have a place. But more importantly, guardrails are meant for us to have that place that we have that silence to listen to them. That's really what it's more about. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, when I was called to Africa, I knew I was called, but I shared it with a friend and eventually, and my family and, and everybody, and, and they helped me place guardrails up. Yeah. You know, like, if you're going to Africa, my wife was like, well, do this, do that, get your malaria medicine. Yeah. And those were all healthy guardrails. So there was this calling, but then there's this agreement with the community. Mm -hmm. And even with the Bridge to Uganda community, there was an agreement with them. We're going to go at this time. We're going to film this. We're going to bring these people. And so, and I think that's where we lose traction in our relationship with God because we're not intentional. It's like, okay, God, I know you're calling me to be holier. Yeah. I mean, everybody probably feels that, right? Um, so now how do I do that? Okay, God, if you want me to be holier, and I haven't been going to Mass, maybe I should go to Mass yeah. and put that on the schedule, or go to confession and put that on the schedule, or, or go to adoration and put that on the schedule. Or even in my house, I have a chair that I pray in. My kids do all their kinds of crazy things in the chair, but I, for me personally, there are guardrails. I know I'm called to pray, so I have a chair, and it's the only thing I do in that chair is pray and nothing else. Uh, so my head's focused there. Uh, and I just think that's so important and so human Sometimes we think that a relationship with God is just this amorphous spiritual thing. And it can feel amorphous, yeah. but then God wants it to be, to take on flesh and bone. That's what happens in the church. That's what happens with the people around us. And that's what happens when we set boundaries for ourselves. Yeah, yeah no, I think that makes uh, perfect sense. We have to have those, uh, those, those boundaries there uh, because they help show us what to do. Like one of the beautiful things is for 40 hours, we're going overnight here uh, so we needed people to sign up to be with our lord overnight and god bless them i am not doing a 3 a.m holy hour there's one thing i know that the lord has granted me and the gift of waking up in the morning is not one of them uh, but you know there are people that god is asking them to do this boundary or do this challenge and there are guardrails so do i have work in the morning do i have to you know do I have to go and, you know, take, take care of my kids or, you know, and God helped them navigate that. That's right. So, yeah. And I think even think about how we had signups for 40 hours. It was like, okay, we think God's calling us to have the Eucharist exposed for 40 hours. Um, we invited the church to that. And then we made an agreement with the church, sign up for these hours so that we know that we're covered. Yeah. So it's not like one person's like, well, I wonder if they need help right now at 2 AM. It's like there were guardrails set and, and boundaries set. And so, I think a healthy relationship with God is one where we hear these, this personal call from God, but then we act on it in very concrete, structured ways, um, and it, it, that involves other people. Um, you know, it was funny, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think frequently about uh, the, this, the gospel, and in the gospel, Jesus talks about how at the coming of the Son of Man, uh, there will be people eating and drinking and partying and being married and all these things and just rushing through life and missing God, yeah. just like in the days of Noah. Um, and it, w it just reminded me how important it was to let God be an instructor to me and to accept that, you know what, it might be hidden from other people that God's instructing me. Because like the people who are eating and partying and doing all that stuff, they're not making the time for God, so they can't see that relationship with God that I'm having. Uh, what do you do when you're in situations, Father? Because I'm sure this happens even as a priest, 
where you're trying to walk with God, but the people around you don't necessarily see him or understand that, and they're rushing through life, and they're kind of like, rush along with me. Yeah. What do you do in those moments? I, I usually just grab their hand and, and go running. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but no, I think, you know, in those moments, you just kind of have to trust in God, right? You have to trust that, okay, God, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I know people aren't going to like me, or they're just going to find it weird and not understand it, but that I'm doing your will. And so just trying to, you know, just do that simple thing. You know, uh, one of the things I, I give out a lot in confession is I'll just simply invite people to pray the prayer, Jesus, I trust in you. Mm-hmm. And to use that because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We have these worries. We have these anxieties. Um, we're like, are people going to, you know, turn away from me? Are people going to be afraid? And those are all normal things. Mm-hmm. I experience the same things too. But that being said, uh, we have to remember that it's not our will, but God's will in our life. And so just kind of, uh, you know, beginning to just turn to him in those moments, I think is uh, so, so important. Because I get that temptation. I liked the, you know, I liked the party and I liked having a good time when I was younger. And, you know, I turned away from my, my faith because of that. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I knew it wasn't making me happy. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. It's like, okay, if you do that, are you actually happy? Or do you just pretend to be happy? So. Yeah, you know, um, in the second reading, uh, what I wrote in my notes at Mass was, uh, who and what is your joy? Because at the end of the second reading, St. Paul says, make no provision for the desires of the flesh. So where am I getting my joy from? Is my joy really from God? Or is it from all these other things? And, it, and I think the gospel and the readings are, are inviting us to make a decision. Mm-hmm. God's saying, look, some people are going to say yes to me and some are going to say no. And what are you going to decide? Some people are trying to find all their joy from worldly things and some are trying to find their joy from a personal relationship with me as a Catholic. And who are you going to be? And, you know, it's funny. Jesus says that there'll be two people standing right next to each other, but only one is really walking with God. And so sometimes we forget that, like, it's not about just looking Catholic and going through the motions. But it's about really making that personal decision to say, Jesus, you can be my instructor. And, and, and if we don't do that, we're missing out. I mean, God misses out on us, but we miss out on him, this God who wants a relationship with us. Yeah. You know, as you're saying this, I think of our, our Protestant brothers and sisters, and they're great people, and so I don't want to disparage any of them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the big thing in the Protestant you know, faith is that you make a yes to God, mm-hmm. and then you're once saved, always saved, as soon as you make that. But that's not true. We don't hold that truth as Catholics. It's basically, we have to make a continual yes to God. We have to make a continual commitment. I don't just get to say yes one day and then do whatever I want to after the fact. We Instead, every day I have to choose, is this what's going to bring me joy? Is this what's going to bring me God? You know, before, our, you know, before we started filming today, we you know, asked for the intercession of St. Augustine. And you know, I always loved St. Augustine because he was the original party animal. Uh, I mean, he straight says in his confessions that he stole like pears because he thought it was fun to do. Like he didn't want it. He wasn't hungry. He just literally stole them and then threw them away. Uh, but he also says later on that our hearts are restless until they rest in, in you, O Lord. And how true is that? We do all these things because we're restless. We want happiness. We want joy. And yet we don't go to the source of joy so often. And, and, and I think that's... Um... I think that's what God wants. I think our heart, even after we've said yes to God once, our heart will, we, will remain restless unless we say yes to God in this circumstance and in tomorrow's circumstance and the next circumstance. So that foundational yes, that, that maybe happened at a pivotal point in your life, it, it has to continue. It would be like saying yes to my wife uh, on our wedding day, yeah. <laughs> but then I got to say yes to her every day or our marriage is going to fall apart, exactly. you know? And the same thing in our relationship with God. And so, you know, if we have Protestant brothers and sisters or even Catholic brothers and sisters who said, well, I said yes, or I was baptized, so I'm good. And my uncle's a priest, so, you know, I've got a relationship with God because he's a priest. I hear people say things like that all the time. Are you a, are you a Christian? Well, my uncle's a priest. It's like, well, okay. Um, or I was baptized. Okay. Are you saying yes today? And are you saying your best yes today? 
And, and that's all God really wants. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what Mary did, and that's who we're imitating. She said the first yes to Jesus, and she said it um, at the Annunciation. You know, she said it when Jesus was born. She said it throughout his life, not just at the very beginning. Yeah. 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 So, sorry, you're just reminding me when you're talking about we, you know, we can, you know, be like, oh, I have an uncle who's a priest. You just remind me of a story of uh, my first assignment. We had this uh, older woman. She's gone to Christ now, but uh, uh, her, name, her nickname was Honey. Mm -hmm. And she comes up to me after Mass one day, and she goes, Father, I just want to let you know that you're my ticket to salvation. And I just looked at her and I said, I said, honey, I'm not my own ticket to salvation. I can't be yours. So. Right, right. Yeah, it's here's, only with God. Yeah. Here's the ticket to salvation. Exactly. There's the ticket to salvation. Exactly. It's Jesus Christ. Yeah. But I think, you know, going back to that, we have that. We have to, you know, recognize that Christ, the most blessed sacrament, that's our ticket to salvation. Mm -hmm. But that can be difficult. You know, um, going back to uh, our first reading, right, it says that, the mountain of the Lord will be the highest, the house of the Lord will be the highest house on the highest mountain. And we have to let God be the highest thing in our life. And it says with that, when we do, you're going to have these, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm blanking on all the scripture, so, but, uh, you know, we're going to have peace in our world. Like, you know, swords are going to be turned into plowshares and pruning hooks. And, you know, we're going to have all this peace in our life. And that's so important, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to be a challenge to get there. And I think so often, Dan, if we're honest, like when we come to prayer, you know, we don't do it because it's uncomfortable when we start. Mm -hmm. You know, we come in and we sit in silence and we are not a silent culture. Our phones are buzzing all the time. We have notifications. We have replies and all that. And so trying to build up that silence mm -hmm. can be very difficult for us. And, you know, it's almost like we have war in ourselves. You know, those, are, those swords and spears that we hear in the first reading, that's our own life. That's the things that we're experiencing. But when we allow God to be the center, He's going to turn those things into the things of instruments of peace in our life. I mean, He can only be God. If you want Him in your life, He can't be a hobby. He can't be a sideshow. He can't be number two or three. Yeah. He's either God or, or He can't be there because He can only be Himself. Yeah. And Christ can only be the Christ, the King, or He can't be here. He, he can't just be somebody on the side or a genie in a bottle or... Uh, a hobby, he has to be your God. And, and the funny thing is, is he promises that if you make him the highest thing and you seek first the kingdom of heaven, all the other things come together in time, he says. But the first step is having a relationship with him. And then things fall together with work and family and friends. And it might not be the way that you wanted it to fall together, but it will fall together in his way and it's going to be the best way. Um, you know, it was funny, so as we wrap up our podcast today, we were talking with the teens last night during adoration, trying to guide them through that. And we invited them to kind of be still and to let God speak to them. And the, the song, one of the songs we sang at Mass, um, it says, My soul in stillness waits, and my hope is in you, O Lord. And I think sometimes that's all we have to do is get to a point, like we help these teens get to, where our soul will in stillness wait for God to speak to us. Um, and you're right, it's so hard for us to do that, uh, especially in our busy day. But sometimes it's made a lot easier when we come to a place like a church. Yeah. As practical and as crazy as that sounds, just coming here for 10 minutes, coming before the Eucharist for 10 minutes, it's easier to get still so that your soul can then wait for God to speak. And, and we taught these kids last night, we said, tell God whatever is bothering you. Even if it seems like it's going to distract you from prayer, well, then bring that to prayer and tell it to God. And then in stillness, wait for what God has to say about that. And then we encouraged the kids last night. We said, now that you've shared your stuff with God and listened to him, ask him, what's the one thing you want to say to me? And then in stillness, wait and listen. And Father, what some of these kids shared with us afterwards about how God spoke to them was just remarkable. Um, and so, and I think for all of us as Catholics, that's what we have to do. We have to allow our soul to in stillness wait for him and to give him our hearts and then invite him to speak into our hearts uh, in that personal relationship. And I think when we do, that's when Catholicism, our, our Catholic faith in our lives just comes to life. That's when Christ comes to life in us. And I think that we're who God wants us to be. Yeah. You know, I say this uh, sometimes when people ask me about prayer, I say, you know, go before him, 
you know, and tell him everything on your heart. And don't just say, God, you know everything that's on my heart. That's cheating. That's not what we're called to do. Literally, we have to lay it out word for word, verbatim, you know, so that we know exactly what we're upset about. Uh, you know, maybe even write it out if we have to. Um, but as much time as we spent talking to the Lord, we have to spend at least that much time, if not more, listening in that period. Because, again, if we don't give him the time to talk to us, we're not going to ever hear anything back. And then it seems like prayer is fruitless when we do it like that. So Because we're, we're not really praying. We're not really having a conversation. Yeah. We're just giving a list of demands exactly. as if we're the ones in charge. Exactly. And really we have to come and tell him our heart because he wants us to tell him what's on our heart. But then we have to come and we have to be listeners and we have to allow him to be the instructor. Uh, and I think that's when you're really living your Catholic faith is when you've allowed God to become your instructor at the highest thing, the highest peak and mountain, uh, and seek Him first. And, and when you do, the other things come together in life. Um, again, maybe in surprising or unexpected or even undesired ways, but they come together in the right way. And, and if we don't, we'll be like the people Jesus talked about. We'll just miss God. Like in the Gospel, people just missed Him, and He was there the whole time. And they lived their whole lives, and they miss Him. I, Father, I thought for today to, to end us in prayer, uh, before you give us your priestly blessing, I'm going to invite our listening audience uh, just to allow Jesus to be an instructor. So I'm going to pray a quick little prayer and then invite people to repeat words after me to God, to welcome God as an instructor uh, in our church and in their lives. And then if you could give your blessing. Sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, all of us need you to be a personal instructor. And uh, today, God, we want to invite you to be that instructor. So if you're in the listening audience, uh, just repeat these words after me uh, if you'd like to allow God to be an instructor in your life uh, more deeply as a Catholic. So just repeat these words after me. Lord God, Lord God I, invite you I invite you to be, to be my instructor. My instructor. I invite you to be my God. I invite you to be my God. And I invite you to be my Savior. And I invite you to be my Savior. Help me to have. Help me to have. The Catholic. The Catholic. And personal. And personal. Relationship with you. Relationship with you. You want me to have. You want me to have. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you, Father. Thank God you so you much. Dan. Too many times Catholics leave Mass feeling as disconnected from God as they felt when they walked into Mass. That's because they never welcomed the personal conversation God wants to have with them there. If that's you sometimes, join us now for Afterword as we seek to live in a relationship with God's Word after having heard it on Sunday and discover for yourself the personal conversation God wants to have with you.